um, we'll be talking about racial segregation today. So I'd like to start with a quick poll to find out how comfortable you all are talking about race and racism. So I'm gonna launch this poll. Um, the poll question is, how comfortable do you feel talking about race and racism? Uh, very uncomfortable, mostly uncomfortable, mostly comfortable, or very comfortable. So I'll give you all a few seconds to fill this poll out. Great, we're getting to majority of votes. So I'm gonna stop the poll and share the results. It looks like most of you are mostly comfortable, which is really great to hear, um, or very comfortable. And there's a few folks who are mostly uncomfortable or very uncomfortable, and we really appreciate you being in this space with us today, um, despite your discomfort. Um, we thank you so much for being brave. Um, talking about racism can be um, hard, and we'll be digging into the national, regional, and local history of residential racial segregation. So uncomfortable feelings may come up as you remember difficult experiences or learn about new information. We encourage you to take care of yourselves and also to accept some level of discomfort. Try to notice your feelings about um, without fighting to shut them down and remain open um, because as the brilliant author James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Pam and Cynthia to walk us through our history. Thank you all. Thank you, Karen. And thank you all for being here today. Good afternoon. Our history that we're going to give you is taken from Richard Rosting's book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, and from local history from the city of Menlo Park. And I think somebody has a sound on. Okay. Um, although, the local history we present is from Menlo Park. It is very likely that wherever you live, your city has a similar past. This picture here appeared in a series of three articles, Uneven Ground, written by Kate Bradshaw. And it illustrates the disparities between the different neighborhoods in terms of water quality, asthma rates, educational opportunities, walkability, and more. The Spanish explorers arrived in 1769, but let's remember that the Romay Tushaloni are the original peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. And we're here long before the history on which we're presenting begins. We'll begin our timeline with the first zoning laws. And I'd like to ask Ross Smith, if you would please turn your mic on and your camera on, I can't see you, and read the main text of this slide. Okay, I'm gonna ask um, if Jen Wollison, if you would please turn your mic on and read this slide. Thank you. Um, 1870s to 80s racial zoning laws. Americans have used zoning to exclude people based on race and immigration status since the 1800s. As a local example, during the gold rush, Chinese immigrants who were subject to the, to the discriminatory foreign mining tax opened laundry businesses to wash miners dirty clothes, which they were unwilling to wash themselves because it was women's work. In response, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed more than a dozen laundry ordinances in the 1870s and 80s, including one that prohibited these businesses from operating, quote, without permission from 12 neighbors, end quote, 
due to the complaints that, quote, the presence of Chinese laundries were depreciating their home values, end quote. Thank you. In 1917, the Supreme Court ruled on a Kentucky regulation that made it, quote, unlawful for any Negro to occupy a residence on any block in which a greater number of houses were occupied by white folk and an unlawful for a white person to occupy a residence in a Negro block. The 1917 court ruling found this, the Kentucky regulation to be unconstitutional because it was racially discriminatory. For this slide, I'd like to ask Mara Palmer Lohan um, to turn your mic on and read the title and the main text of this slide. Thank you. 1921 single family zoning laws. In 1921, four years after the Supreme Court rules that racially restrictive zoning is unconstitutional, communities pass single family zoning laws, which are upheld by the Supreme Court in 1926. The majority opinion describes apartments as encroaching like parasites until finally the residential character of the neighborhood and its desirability as a place of detached residence, residences are utter, utterly destroyed. Thank you. So here in the chart, you see Menlo Park zoning regulations. They describe different residential zones, including several single family home zones for different minimum lot sizes duplex zones, triplex zones, and various multifamily home zones. In addition to the coded tactic of single family zoning, racially restrictive covenants governed entire neighborhoods. This is a point of confusion that I want to be clear about. Racially discriminatory zoning was deemed unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court in 1917. But covenants are legal agreements between private parties and therefore they are allowed to discriminate based on race until 1948. Then they too were struck down. And I'd like to ask Balda Bertoni, and if I mispronounce your name, please, please, please correct me. It's Vlada Bordnik. And you want me to read the title and the main? Um, yes, please. Um, no, just read the racially restrictive covenant. Okay. Yeah. So class five race restriction that no person of African, Japanese, Chinese, or Mongolian descent shall use or occupy such property or any part thereof unless such person or persons are employed as servants by a Caucasian occupant of some portion of such property. Thank you. We'll give you just a few seconds here to read the ad. Note the home listing in the restricted deed. Thank you. So here's our timeline thus far. Uh, you see it starts in the 1800s and goes until 1948, uh, Supreme Court ruling. So racially discriminatory zoning is ruled unconstitutional and enforcement of racially restricted covenants is also ruled unconstitutional. So we're good, right? Nope. Remember single family zoning? Well, it's expensive to buy a single family home, so people needed loans. So let's talk about loans. For this slide, I'd like to ask Leah Elkins, if you would please read the title and main text for us. Sure, and it's Leah. Leah, thank you. No worries. 1930s redlining. During the depression, the federal government began to insure home loans in order to help people keep and buy homes and to encourage private banks to make loans, to make loans. When assessing loans, the federal government took into account the following risk factors, among others, the proximity to other homes with freakish architectural design, 
the site's proximity to nuisances, such as billboards, service stations, or stables, and whether the neighborhood included mixed racial or social groups. The federal government created maps that color-coded neighborhoods by risk level. Those shaded red were uninsurable. Next slide, please, and thank you very much. In 1944, the GI Bill provided low interest home mortgages to soldiers returning from World War II, creating a boom in single family home ownership. But black veterans do not qualify for the GI Bill because buyers in integrated neighborhoods do not qualify for federal home loans. In a 1960 hearing by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, Ella Alsberth, the executive director of the Palo Alto Fair Play Council, and Tara Hall Pittman from the NAACP testified that Black veterans were unable to purchase homes in white-only neighborhoods of Menlo Park. And now I'd like to ask Lydia Lee if you would just read Ella Alsberth's testimony. So this is Ella Alsberg, the executive director of the Palo Alto Fair Play Council, speaking at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in 1960. There were veterans who came back from active service and decided they wanted to live. Some of them trained in California and married and wanted to live in an area which we are reporting on. There was nothing in the provisions of this federal, uh, nothing in the provisions of the federal government's activities which made it necessary for people who got this assistance in developing homes to sell to the veterans. The veterans were excluded completely in our area from the white tracks. Thank you. For this slide, I'd like to ask if Timmy Most would read the title and the main text for us. Yes, uh, 1945 to 50 is the suburban housing boom. Builders who try to develop integrated communities can't obtain federally insured financing. So black Americans are generally excluded from suburban developments. One local developer, Joseph Eichler, refuses to exclude non-whites from his developments. A local group tries to develop a multiracial neighborhood but cannot get financing. Author Wallace Stegner leaves the group when they agree to the all white terms required for federal financing. That community is known today as Ladera and Portola Valley. Karen, could you please tell us about Ladera today? Yes, Ladera um, is confronting their history and trying to make some repairs. Um, they have formed a DEI committee that's doing many things. In a, and one of the things is they're trying to work with lawyers to change all of the deeds and covenants in their, in their community at once, because that's a lot more efficient than doing it one by one. Um, and that requires a, a vote of the homeowners association. Um, so they're working on that. And they're also putting together sort of an FAQ and a nice package so that residents can change their deed, not to erase history, but to have some words about it and acknowledge the wrong. Um, they've also looked up four of the families, the four families who were not allowed to participate in the development and are trying to reach them and make some amends with them as well. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so in unincorporated land near Menlo Park, developers built the community they call Bell Haven as a predominantly white middle-class suburb. Bellhaven then became part of the city of Menlo Park in 1949, while it was still predominantly white. Soon after Menlo Park annexes the Bellhaven community, Menlo Park's master plan consultant proposes increasing minimum lot sizes. Um, Jennifer Rodriguez, would you please read the headline and the quote on the right? which is an excerpt from this article. Uh, headline, 1953 Zoning Preserves Character, Planning Consultant Outline Proposal, Master Plan Described as Effort to Preserve City's Character. The minimum lot size increase is to protect what we've got. 
There are no reasons why slums or blighted areas should ever exist in Menlo Park. Thank you. Leslie Feldman, could you please read the headline in the main text of this slide? 1950s, 101 divides the community. In the 1950s, the state widens Highway 101, creating a barrier between neighborhoods. The NAACP refers to the widened highway as the concrete curtain. Thank you. Um, I grew up in East Palo Alto, so I remember when my friends and I, we would cross 101 on University Avenue. At that time, it was four lanes with a signal light, just like crossing El Camino today. Once the freeway was completed, we no longer had easy access to the town, downtown theater because of this concrete curtain. In the 1950s and 1960s, real estate agents targeted Black homeowners in San Francisco, Oakland, and Richmond to market homes in Bellhaven and East Palo Alto. This flyer is a 1955 advertisement in the Sun Reporter, a newspaper serving the Black community of San Francisco. Realtors hired buses to bring prospective Black buyers to the predominantly white neighborhoods on weekends preying on anti-Black prejudice in order to convince white residents to panic sell at low prices. Realtors would then sell those same homes to Black families at inflated prices. This realtor practice was known as blockbusting. An integrated group of Bellhaven residents attempted to stop blockbusting through education. They pointed out that sellers were paying a steep price for their prejudice by panic selling at low prices. They also filed appeals to this California State Real Estate Commission and their appeals go unanswered. Joanne Sanders, could you please read the headline and the main text of this slide? Sure, thank you. 1963 to 66, Rumford and Fair Housing Acts. In 1963, the California legislature passes the Rumford Act, a precursor to the Federal Fair Housing Act. In 1964, the California Real Estate Association, California apartment owners, and other property management organizations repeal the Rumford Act by passing Proposition 14. In 1966, the California Supreme Court rules Proposition 14 unconstitutional and the Rumford Act is restored. This picture to the left shows local demonstrators in Palo Alto that opposed Proposition 14 and were uh, trying to gather support for the Rumford Act to remain in effect. I have another story for you. My parents were into instrumental in collecting data for the passage of the Rumford Act. My dad could pass for white. So when he went to a place, the property managers and the realtors were very happy to talk to him. The next step was my mother would go with him to look at the place. And I remember how my mother felt stating that she hated going with dad the second time, knowing they would be turned down because she's obviously black. So let's review the timeline again. Uh, the discriminatory lending criteria by the federal government leads to segregated communities and deprives non-white families of the benefits of home ownership. Realtor practices known as blockbusting convert formerly white communities into black communities. In the 1960s, California passes the Rumford Act, which is a precursor to the Federal Fair Housing Act, despite opposition from realtor and landlord organizations. The segregation of housing creates segregated schools. I'd now like to ask Mikhail Bortoni, and please correct me. That is so wrong. Michal. Michal Bortnik, thank you. Michal, thank you. 
1960s, segregated high schools. In 1967, the NAACP National Magazine publishes an article about the dispute over new school district boundaries that create a mostly black high school, Ravenswood, and a mostly white high school, Mill Atherton. Despite pushback from Belhaven and East Palo Alto residents, a school board member defends the move saying, this will be putting our noses in something that does not concern us. Thank you. Another piece of history here, the Ravenswood High School was closed in 1976. So the students from East Palo Alto and South Haven who had attended Ravenswood High School were bussed off to six to four different high schools in the Sequoia Union High School District. One of the schools was a 45 minute bus ride one way. There was only one school, Menlo Atherton, that was within walking distance. So many Bellhaven students um, attended that school. Thankfully, finally, in 2013, the Sequoia Union High School District Board of Trustees voted to allow East Palo Alto students to attend nearby Menlo Atherton High. Now, may I have Michelle De De Haif, De Hoff? Yep, Michelle De Hoff. Hi. 1975 to 1976, white exodus from Ravenswood. In 1975 and 1976, the Menlo Park City School District annexes the predominantly white suburban park and Menlo Oaks neighborhoods from the Ravenswood City School District. Thank you. In 1976, Margaret Tinsley and a group of Ravenswood parents filed a lawsuit contending that the isolation of minorities in their neighborhoods leads to unequal educational opportunities. The lawsuit settles in 1986 with an agreement that each year 166 kindergarten to second grade minority students can transfer from the Ravenswood Elementary School District to other school districts, including Menlo Park, Las Lomitas and the Palo Alto Unified School District. So I'll read the text at the bottom in yellow says, because of the inter-district racial imbalance in student enrollment, minority students are realistically isolated. And so a segregated school system exists. Deidre Lampkin, a member of Menlo Together and a resident of Bell Haven, has agreed to tell her story. And while she was unable to join us here tonight, we will still be able to hear her story via video. So just a quick personal story. I now have a soon to be eight year old little boy. Um, and my son was actually able to um, get into the Tinsley program. However, even though we live in Menlo Park, he was assigned to a school in San Carlos. Um, I did try to get him into the Menlo Park School District, but wasn't able to. Ultimately, I decided to not enroll him in the program because that would mean that I would have to put my then six-year-old son on a bus for an hour in the morning to get to school and then an additional hour plus dependent on traffic to come back home. And I just was not willing to, um, to do that to, to my baby. I'd now like to ask Nicola Taylor, if you would read the title and the main text of this slide. Nicole? Me? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Couldn't Nicole. read my own handwriting here. Nicola. Yes, Nicolas. <laughs> Happy to. Thanks, Pam. Thank uh, you. 1983, more white families leave Ravenswood. In 1983, the Willows and Flood neighborhoods transfer from the Ravenswood City School District to the Menlo Park City School District. In their unsuccessful appeal of the decision, the Ravenswood City School District argues that the proposed transfer will isolate minority students in the Ravenswood district while surrounding them with overwhelmingly white districts. Thank you. Here is a racial dot map from a 2010 overlay with to today's Menlo Park School District boundaries. 
Note the Menlo Park City School District's expansion stop is at the color line, which is green. We also have another story from Deirdre. So next slide, please. My family has personally experienced the divisiveness of redlining. Um, as I indicated earlier, I live in Menlo Park in the Bellhaven community. And my eight-year-old son at the time loves sports. Uh, he still does. Um, and he wasn't able to play Little League Baseball in Menlo Park. I was essentially told, um, based on living on the other side of the freeway, my son was to play in East Palo Alto instead. Although he was able to play that first year in Menlo Park, I was, I was warned that this was a one-time exception. To make a long story short, me speaking up at a few city council meetings, changes were made and now any Bellhaven resident's child who's interested in playing baseball in Menlo Park will not be turned away. Nancy LaRocca, would you please read this slide? The text. 2000, sure, 2006, subprime lending spree. Many Bellhaven residents lose their homes to foreclosures after refinancing their mortgages with subprime loans in the 90s, when predatory lenders went door to door in segregated minority neighborhoods to promote these risky loans. <clears throat> A 2013 study found that at the height of the housing boom, Black and Hispanic families making more than $200,000 a year were more likely on average to be given a subprime loan than a white family making less than $30,000 a year. Thank you. Let me read that again. At the height of the housing boom, Black and Hispanic families making more than $200,000 a year were more likely on average to be given a subprime loan than a white family making less than $30,000 a year. In many cases, investors purchased the properties at rock bottom prices and then, and then resold them at a significant profit. These are the same communities that were redlined as the next slide shows. You may also notice that the change in the dots to orange indicates that the color of people have changed from a segregated community that was mostly black to now a mostly Latinx community. We it's clear here that when we look at these dots, that it's not easy, that it's not hard to find communities at, at, to target for these subprime loans. Real estate investment opportunities, such as buying homes near the new Facebook headquarters in Menlo Park, lead to displacement of longtime residents. And Karen, could you please explain that map at the bottom? Karen? Well, I'll explain it. The little map- No, I got it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so some of the red dots, the ones on either side are job centers. So two on the right are Facebook headquarters. One on the left is a, a Stanford medical facility. And the two in the middle are single family homes in Bellhaven. And the flyer is saying what a great investment it is. This is sort of a you too can be a real estate investor. You go in a small group and you buy one of these single family homes, which they then remodel and rent out at a much higher rent. So it seems like a really great investment opportunity. Next slide. So what does a human cost look like? Here is who sits on the other side of that incredible investment opportunity. The text here summarizes a 2018 article that appeared in The Guardian. And Francis Hom Kishnek, would you please read the text on this slide? Sure. 2018, displacement is personal. After investors purchase a Bellhaven property on Pierce Road, 
they increase rent from $1,100 to $1,900 a month. Tenants have 60 days to sign the new lease. At least seven families vacate. Those who stay continue to live with cracks in the walls, poor lighting, dirty carpets, and pest infestations. Quote, it is a completely unjust situation, even if what's happening to these people may be legal, said Daniel Saver, an attorney for the tenants. Of the disproportionate impact on Latinos and African-Americans in the neighborhood, one tenant says, quote, they are displacing us. They are pushing us away. Is this pur purposeful? Thank you. So gentrification, displacement, and exclusion are most intense in formerly red line neighborhoods, which became the targets for predatory loans and the site of some of the highest rates of foreclosure. You'll note on this map from the Urban Displacement Project that the areas in purple, Bellhaven and East Palo Alto, are experiencing displacement and gentrification at a very advanced level compared to other neighborhoods. The areas in light orange to red are areas where there is advanced exclusion. We see the same disparities in formerly red line neighborhoods. Just to jump in, this is a map of COVID. The previous one is a map of COVID infection rates. And you can see that the formerly red line communities have the highest rates with one exception is I believe there was a congregate living facility that for a short period of time had a high infection rate in the middle of Menlo Park. I would carry like on. To... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be calling on some people a second time. So I'm going to start with Leah Elkins and ask if you would read the text on this slide. Uh, yes, and uh, I'm sorry to say, again, it's Leah. Oh, did I did it twice? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, 1990s to 2020, jobs outpaced housing. Healthy balance equals one and a half jobs per housing unit. In the six years between 2011 and 2017, local governments approved commercial growth contributing to 627,000 new jobs while approving only 138,000 new housing units, worsening an already critical jobs housing imbalance in the Nine County Bay Area. Thank you. So let's refresh our memories with this timeline. Segregated neighborhoods lead to segregated schools. Predatory lending practices target communities of color. Formerly red line neighborhoods are now disproportionately impacted by gentrification and displacement and now COVID. For this slide, I'd like to ask Lydia Lee if you would read the text. Sure. Uh, 2012 to 16, the city of Menlo Park updates its housing element for the first time since 1992 in response to a lawsuit for failing to zone for new housing. Although city staff proposes new housing all over the city, residents of West and Central Menlo Park fiercely oppose new housing in their neighborhoods. In the general plan and downtown specific plans, Menlo Park zones for 4,500 new housing units in Bellhaven, Bayside, and only eight, 680 housing units downtown. A side note is that through the Connect Menlo zoning, the city zoned for over 30,000 jobs in the massive amount of office space that was created. So this concludes our timeline. I wanna thank everyone so much who read a slide. Your active participation has helped bring this presentation to life. I will now turn this back to Karen Carmacho. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was a lot. <laughs> um, so I would like to guide us through a few quick breaths together. See if you could just take a deep breath in and exhale. One more. Deep breath in. 
and exhale. Thank you all so much. I'm now going to introduce Heather Hopkins to lead us through some group reflection exercises. But first, um, I'd like to make sure that this history sinks in for everyone. Um, and hopefully that breathing exercise helped with that. Um, so uh, Heather, would you like to lead us through the reflection exercise? Absolutely. So everyone uh, get out your phone, or if you're on your phone, go to your text messaging app or function. <laughs> I guess it's not an app. Um, and we're going to process together using a word cloud. So um, once you're in your text uh, text function, you're going to text uh, the number, text, make a text to the number 22333. That's who you're texting. And in the body of the text, you're going to type M together. Karen, is it 775 or 223? Hold on. Uh, 22333. So um, this is in the chat as well, and I will repeat it. And if for some reason this is not easy or working for you, please don't worry. You'll still enjoy this activity. So start a new text to the number 22333, and then text M together, like Menlo together, 775. And once you get a message back, which can take a few seconds, Reply with one word that describes how you feel about what you just heard, and then we'll we'll see as a group what comes up. And hopefully you see my screen. Yep. Yes. Okay. Great. So we have a couple of people who have texted in. Um, feel free to text a word, um, more than one word, but separately in separate texts. So concerned. <laughs> And of course, at this moment, my dog has decided to make himself a bed next to my computer. So please ignore the scratching. <laughs> Heartbroken, sad, disgusted, ashamed, disheartened, discouraged, helpless. Muy triste. Horrified. Implicated. A lot of sad and angry. So a lot of people may be hearing this for the first time or just getting hit in the head, over the head with it again. Wow. Ashamed, curious, disturbed. Sobering. Thank you, guilty, grim. All right. Thank you, lots of, lots of feelings. So in a few minutes, we'll go into some breakout groups. But before we do that, we're going to give you a few minutes to reflect and journal your responses. Um, and so the questions you'll see on the screen here, and we will also put them in the chat. And um, if you're Spanish speaking, you have a slightly different question, um, which will also be in the chat and on the translation. So the questions are, in what ways did you, your family, or your ancestors either disrupt or help sustain residential racial seg segregation? And the second question is, considering this history, what are the implications for you in moving towards housing justice? And so you only have two minutes to think this through. I will set a timer. Um, and so you may not you know, even get to the second question, or you may choose to do the second question before the first question. And we'll play a little bit of music, and I will give you a sense of um, how much time you have.
Thank you. Do you mind going to the next slide? Thank you. So before we go into groups, um, just a few things to consider uh, to deepen your conversations. The first is that please remember um, to keep these conversations confidential. You can share your learnings, but please uh, consider what you hear from others to be confidential unless you ask their explicit permission to use their name or their story. Um, there will be a timer on the screen, so please uh, take a look at that timer and um, share time equally. Speak from your own experience using I statements. Trust what others tell you about their own experience, even if you don't immediately understand what they are telling you. If you are hurt by someone during this conversation, try to assume good intent. If you have caused someone harm um, without intending to or, or with intending to, though I'm sure that's not going to happen, uh, despite your good intent, please acknowledge it. And finally, please stay open to all the information and feelings that may come up. Um, these can be difficult conversations. One important logistical note, if you are Spanish speaking and want to be in a Spanish speaking breakout room, um, go ahead and click the, the white box, the not now box when the um, prompt comes up for you uh, and don't, don't join the group when you're invited. Everyone else, please go ahead and click the blue button to join the breakout groups and enjoy your conversations. Um, again, you'll see a countdown timer in the right top of your screen. And we'll see you back in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10, 10 minutes. minutes, but I need another five seconds to get the breakout rooms ready. And we are ready now. So off you go. Okay. Lydia, tell me what you would like to share from your conversation. So in our discussion, um, in terms of taking action, we really, um, all of us were really interested in getting more involved in local politics and, and zoning. And I, I'm going to take a moment just to say that I know that the city is working on a updated housing element right now. And there's a committee that um, the applications may be already due. I can't remember, you probably know Heather. So, aha, there you go, right. <laughs> okay, so that is a chance, a great chance for, for citizen, for, you know, for residents to have a, a direct say in how zoning is determined in our, um, in our city. And just in, in general, like realizing how detrimental single family zoning has been, right, in excluding people. Thanks. Thank you. Natasha. Tell me your dog's name first. Hi, sorry. He's trying to be the star here. His name is <laughs> like the candy. He's eating. He is the star. <laughs> <laughs> my name. My name is Natasha. Um, I am actually a pediatrician in this area. I live in East Palo Alto and heard about this from one of my patient's parents and from the East Palo Alto neighbors group. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm, you know, fingers crossed for me, I'm hopefully a future parent to a child in these school districts. I had a wonderful conversation with, I, I will not disclose her name because I'm not sure if she wants her name to be disclosed. I didn't ask her, you know, explicitly, but she reflected Hola. on Pero her. La reflexión de ella. Oh, I Hello. think. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think it went into the English. One <laughs> moment, please. That was our interpreter. Gotcha. Um, the woman who I spoke with was amazing. She reflected on how she was a past um, PTA president um, in the past um, few decades. And she actually, you know, was a little bit hesitant to invite parents of different backgrounds and ethnicities to join the PTA. But then, you know, she got some encouragement and she got some support from the principal of the school that she was the PTA president for. And it turned out to be such a good experience. She did a complete 180 and she also helped lead a campaign for the first um, woman of color superintendent in that area. She has such an amazing story and it was so refreshing to kind of hear that. I just wanted to share it. I'm done speaking. Cool, thank you. There's lots of great things in the chat. Um, anyone interested in raising their hand and, and sharing if you wrote in the chat? And be sure to check it out.
Laura. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for the opportunity to have the, the micro groups. Um, really, um, really interesting. Uh, for me, a, an aha just it popped into my head as we were talking about the attraction, the, the, you know, buying near the best schools mm -hmm. and thinking about the times when I've been in, uh, looking for homes. Um, you know, we've kind of moved a little bit. And, you know, every time there was always that conversation with a realtor about, you know, here's a neighborhood with the best schools. And um, it, it, it was just a watershed moment today thinking about how, um, you know, that continues to perpetuate the issue that we have. Uh, there was some recognition of that in our group. So I thank you for the opportunity to share space. Thank you. Lydia, I assume you just have your hand raised from before. <laughs> no worries. Dana, go ahead. Hi, um, what was just shared? Sorry, I forgot your name, but reminded me. Um, so I'm actually a teacher in San Mateo. So I'm sure that um, a lot of the pieces are very similar in terms of trends and observations around the legislation and the ways these things happen. Um, and I live in Mountain View and I've been engaging with um, Mountain View City for the past year or so around police reform, but working closely with housing justice advocates. And something I find really interesting is the way that um, each community can, like we recognize broader trends or national trends or statewide trends, but each community often seems to treat itself like its own special snowflake um, was one thing that I was thinking about when it comes to these policies is, you know, what is, you know, this Menlo piece, what does it look like in Mountain View where I live? What does it look like in San Mateo where I work? Because obviously there's such a pattern of similar pieces happening elsewhere. Um, so that's just one more thing I remembered. I shared in the chat about how Brett and I were talking about the difference between individual perceptions of these issues and group or institutional perceptions of these issues, where we seem to think if we aren't causing personal harm, we're not causing harm but failing to recognize the way in which the institutions are causing harm all around us. And if we don't speak up against it, then we're perpetuating it. And I really appreciate the thoughts about school segregation because it's definitely something I see in San Mateo um, in the community I teach compared to the communities of affluence that were you know, are across the district. Um, and I, I think it's something that I wish we could consider more carefully. And um, I didn't, quite know how I wanted to finish that sentence, but I want to say thank you for bringing it up because I definitely see and experience it too in my own profession. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I think that was a nice long pregnant pause. Maybe we, um, Karen, are we, okay. should we move on? Yeah. To so, do we carry on then? Yeah. Because uh, I think people are eager to learn what we can do about all of this. Um, so at this point, I want to share that I serve on the Menlo Park Housing Commission. And I want to say that because I want to be really clear that I am not representing the Housing Commission tonight. Um, we have to vote on things. Um, I am representing myself and I'm representing Menlo together. Um, but on your screen are some actions that you can take to reverse racial segregation in Menlo Park and in our region. So um, we at Menlo together will, we tend to watch a lot of city council meetings and we will send emails when it's important for your voice to be heard. Housing Leadership Council does that for all of San Mateo County. So we'll follow up with an email um, with exactly how to sign up for these um, email alerts, but definitely recommend that you do that. Um, another thing you can do is just talk to people that you know about what struck you about what you learned tonight, because like I think Dana said, we all seem to feel like, you know, the social justice problems exist outside of our local community, um, but that's not true. And so it's helpful to look uh, under our own two feet sometimes. So please talk to people. If you have a group of people who you'd like to share this with, reach out to us at Menlo Together and we would be happy to do the workshop or help you do the workshop yourself for your group. And now we're getting to the really meaty ones. What most important, especially for the Menlo Atherton community um, is to communicate with your government leaders about your desire to have more affordable housing in your neighborhood because everybody wants it in the abstract, 
it's very rare that a city council member will hear from somebody that wants more affordable housing in their neighborhood. So anytime you can use your voice to advocate for social justice in your own community with your local leaders, that is a really powerful action. And in a more systemic and planning mode, as has been mentioned, we are at a moment in time where the city is embarking on their new housing element. It's a plan that takes place, planning process that takes place every eight years where we plan for the predicted future housing needs. We and other cities in the Bay Area are far behind and we have not been planning for enough housing. So we have a big deficit. Um, we all have bigger numbers than we've had in the past. Um, and there are ways to plan for all of this housing where it's likely to come to fruition. And there are ways to plan for all of this housing where it's not likely to come to fruition. So the more people who are involved in the process who really want to reverse the past policies of residential segregation, the better outcome we're going to have for housing justice. So I encourage you all to get involved in any of those ways. And, and um, just echo that the housing element in Menlo Park process will have a community education and outreach committee. Um, and I encourage you to apply for that because there's a lot of sort of translation from policy wonkery to actual people's lives. And you would be part of bridging that gap and getting lived experience into the process. Um, oops, sorry, my timer. Um, but what would be really helpful, particularly for this community that attends Menlo Atherton High School, it was mentioned that realtors value test scores and schools value you know, funding per pupil. Menlo Ather, the Sequoia Union High School District is what's called a, used to be called the basic aid district. So there's a lot of money from property taxes that the school district gets to keep. They don't get extra funding when they have extra students. So there's an extra incentive to not build more housing in this kind of very fortunate school district, privileged school district. Now, I think there should be a color of law school funding edition, and somebody needs to write that book, and then we'll create a workshop around it. Um, but that's another whole topic you can look into. So what I would encourage people who care about education and segregation, let's disrupt residential segregation and make school funding more equitable and more abundant for everybody. So that's my particular, like I think to tailor the ask to this group, I think we need to overcome the protective instinct to keep all of the school funding for our schools. And we need to look at it with a, a type of, a, an attitude of abundance and say, let's be fair and let's fund all of the schools to the point that all of our children can have an excellent education. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to do a poll and ask you all, I'm gonna invite you all to take a moment to sort of commit to yourself, one or two or as many as you want. Pardon me, did somebody say something? Um, one or two actions that you will commit to doing after this workshop. So let's see, here we go. I'll give you a few minutes to pick as many items as you want and then we will look at the results. Okay, approaching 70% voted. So last chance to click complete and 75% have voted, 76, still growing. So I'm gonna give you another minute or half a minute. Okay, ending the poll. So these are the results and I'm glad that people are gonna connect to information about when and how to take action. 
definitely going to have a lot of people talking to family and friends and also to their elected leaders, which is fantastic. And the housing element process, we've got a few people who are going to engage in that. Um, you know, you don't have to engage at the very, very, I hope that everybody engages at some level, um, even if it's not joining a committee or going to the wonky meetings. But when you're asked for input, please do share your input. Um, some of the great opportunities for new housing are along El Camino, um, where we have a train station and we have bus lines and it's not only good for um, racial justice, it's also good for the environment because people can take public transit more easily. So um, that concludes our workshop. We would love to hear from you what you thought of it. And we will be putting or have put a link in the chat for an evaluation. Um, we learn a lot from the evaluations. So um, we would love to hear your feedback. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to those of you who helped us read slides and shared your thoughts aloud and were brave in your conversations. Thanks also to those of you who didn't do any of those things. I'm so glad to have all of you here. Just seeing your faces um, makes me feel a little bit like we're in a room together. And soon we actually may be. So thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>